What's up, everyone? How's it going? It's Jay here again, another week of our Ono Live Coffee and Cigars live stream. This is number 50. Whoa, can you believe it? 50 weeks, well, really, 50 episodes of live streaming. It's almost a year. Two more weeks will be a year, and so, yeah, 50. 50, that's kind of exciting, right? 50? Oh, I should put that banner up there, right? 50, there we go, 50. So today is July 8th. And it's another hot, scorching day out here in Baltimore. Like, I don't know where you guys are, but it's scorching here. It's not as bad as it's been the last two days. The last two days have truly been scorching. Like, we're talking like 95 degrees. So, for those of you watching from outside the U.S., it's 35 Celsius. And, you know, unlike other parts of the world that, uh, let's say, like, the Middle East, where it's very dry, here it's very wet. So, it's really kind of unbearable miserable kind of heat and you know i'm a little bit cheap so it's really hot where i where i tend to work so we're here again and we're making coffee and cigars on a thursday night it's now 801 here in baltimore we're broadcasting to you from our studio here in lovely cocky zone which is a little bit north of baltimore city you know all right so how's everyone doing what are you smoking where are you smoking from are you indoors outdoors you know, that's the problem when you're dealing with cigars is that you're trying to find a way to keep yourself cool while also evacuating smoke. So that's always a challenge here in the studio. So I've got the exhaust fan running, but I've also got the air conditioning running, and I'm trying to find a way to circulate all of that to make it lovely. But you, I'm, suddenly I'm already feeling that there's some heat probably from the exhaust. It's pull, it, the exhaust pulls, so it pulls for also from outside, so it's going to get a little bit hot. All right, so what are we doing today? Today we're going to be making some coffee, and the coffee that we're doing to this week is actually, I thought it would be an interesting thing for us to look at in this live stream, is our espresso. And so one of the interesting things about espresso, or one of the, the difficult things about espresso is... If you make a blend and you have a particular flavor profile that you're trying to to manage every, you know, throughout the course of, of, of the year or and year in, year out, you know, the actual coffees and components that are available to you will inevitably change, right? So you could buy a bunch of coffees and have a blend. Oh, Strassi says, no smoking to, to Elsa. So I'm tucking into my plate. Oh, Sarku, nice, nice. That's all right, that's all right. No problem with Sarku. Wait, is Elsa, is that a storm or something? That's a storm, right? Right? All right, but anyway, so, like I was saying, so every, you so you could buy beautiful coffee and, or whatever coffee you want to, to cultivate for your blend, and then eventually you'll run out of it, right? And even if you're working with the same farms and the same farms to get the same kind of lots, even those lots will change and so at some point you're going to have to find a way to blend coffees source coffees and blend them in a way that will carry on with some level of consistency hopefully extreme consistency for the flavor profile you intend and so today i thought that i would go through a little bit of tasting the coffees because right now here at spro we're actually changing over some of the components in our espresso from one crop to the next, right? So what that means is that for the longest time now, we've been using a blend of Ugandan Mount Elgin AB coffee as our base, and then augmenting that with a Chusky coffee from Peru. So it's been a nice blend, and it's what we've been using for the probably the last... I think six months or so. And so now some of that coffee is no longer available and we've moved on to a new blend or a new, a new, yeah, a new blend of coffee. So we're using now as our base, we're using a coffee from Hinotega, Nicaragua called the Marimba. It's a, it's a strictly high grown coffee, um, European prep coffee. So what, it, what does that really mean? It just means that it's high grown and European prep is just that it's washed a certain way. And so that's, that's really what it is. And it's supposed to have nice notes of cocoa and graham crackers and a bit of nuts, right? Which is really kind of 
part of the flavor profile that we're trying to push. And then the next component of that, the, the, the minor component, is this, uh, we got another coffee from Uganda, the Uganda Ruenzori Kisinga, which is a natural processed coffee. And so this one is supposed to have nice notes of dark chocolate and cane sugar and maybe some, and hopefully some nice clean blackberries. So those kind of go together to, well, the intention is that those will go together to produce a really nice, robust espresso that is with good body, that has notes of chocolate, nuttiness on the finish, and some fruitiness on the palate, right? And so also we want to, we're going to roast it to a medium profile, and that's really the basic idea. So the question is, is how well did we achieve that for this one? And then how well are we able to match the two? Like, is there a tremendous difference between the two roast, uh, the, the two blends and roastings, right? So we're going to get into that in just a few moments. And Rusty says, happy 50th. Thanks for making Thursday member. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Glad you, thank you for tuning in. That's the most important part of it. All right. So now let us get our set, <laughs> setup going here. Of course, we're going to need our, our boxes so that you can see. Okay, so I've got two samples, one labeled A, and the other one not labeled because we don't really, if, if, we have, if one is A, we already know that the other is B, right? Okay, so these are the two samples that we're using, and we're using typical nine-ounce cupping glasses that we use here to evaluate coffees, and if you're not familiar, cupping is a method of critically tasting coffees for evaluation, blah, 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 blah. And so as you can see, here is the grind. We're using a fairly medium grind, yes? They're, they're pretty much the same grind size, right? How does that look to you? All right, so, and for this particular nine ounce glass, we're using 13 grams of, uh, of ground coffee. And then now it's time to start. So I'm going to get the water and start timing. We're just going to use the timer and count upwards. So with cupping, we just want to make sure that everything gets wet, all the coffee gets wet, and we come right to the edge. And you should do this all in one swoop while also, as you, if you can see this, I have also wet the entire coffee bed. And we want to make sure that it gets wet because we want to make sure that all of the coffee is is hydrated and now extracting okay so now we're going to let it sit for four minutes all right so as you can see here here is a little bit of light so you can see the, the oh oh gosh be careful try not to bump your table as you can see some you may be able to see this the, um some of the coffee is falling and that's perfectly normal Try not to bump it because you might cause it to fall a lot. But what we're trying to do is also preserve this cap. Like you can kind of see right here the cap of coffee that's floating. And um, you can see it. If I illuminate, you can see there's a cap of, of coffee there. And this, we want to try to preserve that because there's volatile aroma aromatics that are kind of hiding under the cap, right? And when we get to the point where we're going to be evaluating the aromatics, we want to keep those contained so that when we actually break the top with our spoon, we can inhale and, you know, get the full potential flavors. And yes, yes, Wakanda does have some coffees. We're trying to get some more. You know, they're very, ever since, you know, ever since the demise of T'Challa, it's been very difficult to get anything exported out of the country. And add to that the whole global logistics problem, and it's very, very difficult this year. But we're trying, we're trying. You know, we would like to come out with the new Wakanda Forever blend, that would be really nice. All right, so we're rolling along two minutes, we're still halfway there. <sighs> you know, part of how you blend coffees is that, you know, you're, you're, looking at, you're looking in catalogs or talking to the producers and trying to get their, their notes for what their coffees taste like and then you're going to you know bring those in roast them up 
and then do your own sampling, tasting, and then determining whether that those coffees might meet your profile. So basically what we did is we called for samples for different coffees, roasted them up, tasted them and thought, okay, well this might this might go well with that. And or we'll even mix the two and then bring in a bag or two to try it out and hopefully it comes well because we actually do what we call pre-roast blending. So we're taking the components, roasting, uh, blending them together green, roasting them together, and then and that's it. Some, pe some people believe in doing post-roast blending, meaning that you're roasting each of the components separately and then blending them after. You could do either way. Um, I haven't really found great tremendous differences by doing it one or the other. We used to do pre-roast blending, and then now we do post-roast. We, we used to do post-roast blending, now we do pre-roast. So it kind of depends on what you want, right? So something about all of this humidity kind of gives me a little bit of sniffles. So hopefully I can smell. Not a practice. So, Tony, you're having your uh, cherry diet Pepsi again? What did I have? I had diet Pepsi over the weekend. I was at my cousin's place on Sunday for 4th of July, and he was serving the... Uh, they, were, they couldn't find Coke, evidently. They were sold out at the grocery store that day. All right, so we are now at four minutes. So four minutes. Let me stand up and illustrate. So the, what we're going to do is the, the cupping part, the, the, this is what we call the break. And the break is when you take your spoon, this cupping spoon, right, this bowly spoon, and you're going to break the top by pushing it through the crust and pushing it away from you. And as that crust breaks, the aromatics are going to rush out, so you're going to... Right? All at one motion, right? I'll show you. Here we go. Here we go. Then you could stir a little bit. Oh, I have to put some. I need to prepare a rinsing cup. Okay. Now the next one. This one, the, the, the aromatic notes are a little bit more roasty. Interesting. All right, so next we're going to do is we're going to clear it off. There's a little bit of like this, this, uh, this like scummy looking stuff, right? So we're going to remove that. Just by using two spoons to... Sometimes I don't know where I'm going with this. And then, of course, rinse it out. And another round for the other one. This coffee has a lot of floaters. So there's a lot of ground coffee just floating at the top, which will make tasting the coffee a little bit more unpleasant. So since we first added the water, about six and minutes, six and a half minutes have have elapsed. And really we typically wait till about ten minutes before tasting the coffee because we want to let the coffee cool enough so that it doesn't burn your palate. And you know and those of you who've I, I, I'm, undoubtedly everyone has has burned their palate, and you know how unpleasant that can be, so we don't want to do that. And so Tony says the San Lotano Oval Maduro, Oval Maduro, oh, okay, and the Diet Cherry Pepsi, of course, of course. New Mango, New Mango Pepsi. That sounds crazy. Crazy, crazy. All right, so let us... We're going to go ahead and taste see how hot it is so i'm going to take from the a which is the older blend the blend we've been using and mm, 
mm, they're pretty hot. So there are lots of, so the, the, this, this blend, which is the Uganda Peru, lots of body, lots of dark chocolate notes. Definitely some nice peanutty finishing. But on this particular blend, the the fruitiness is diminished. Like it's not a, it's not this particular iteration wasn't heavy on the fruit, but still quite pleasant. You know, it's it's a nice. It's, it turns out to be a really nice espresso. And so, why am I slurping? Slurping helps to spread your the the oxygenated coffee across your palate so that you can get better sensory perception. Hmm? Kind of like how when you're smoking cigars, you're smoking and you're, puff, you're puffing and you're taking it in the mouth and we're tasting it. So it's essentially, it really essentially is the same thing. Like I've had arguments with people in the coffee business. They're like, oh, you know, you really, because a lot of people think you should not smoke before you cup, like the night before. And I, and I kind of tend to agree with that. However, if you're smoking cigarettes, if you're a cigarette smoker, you, of course you've got you're smoking these s sticks of death that have like chemicals l laden into them, and so that chemical residue will occlude your senses. You know, I remember years ago I was sitting with some friends and I thought they were smoking cigarettes, and I was like, I would like to have some tobacco taste. So I asked one for I asked a friend of mine to try one, and he had something I don't know, one of the mainstream cigarettes. And the moment, the, from the very first puff that I took, and you know, I'm only tasting it, right, like a cigar, there was a coating of like chemical on my mouth, my, my, coating my mouth, and I was like, that's disgusting. Like, I never, I never tried it again. But what I'm saying is that, you know, you got, with cigarettes, you have this chemical that coats and occludes your, your sensory perception. However, with cigars, since it is all unnatural, I found that even though I'll smoke a bunch of a cigar or two the night before we do cuppings, it doesn't interfere with my perception because it's a natural product. Well, it's probably a couple reasons. Partially, it's a natural product. And the other side of it is I've been smoking cigars for, what, since 1992. So I'm a little bit more... No smoking the night before. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they say, you know, a lot of people say you shouldn't smoke cigarettes, well, they shouldn't, they just say you shouldn't smoke um, before you cup, the night before you cup, like, but I, you know, like I said, I find that, I, I don't find it to be a problem, I don't think you'd find it to be a problem, you know, Rusty, you've got a big, you've got a very sharp palate, um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about the SCA, well, what are you going to worry about, there's nothing to worry about there, it'll be good times in New Orleans, good times, good times, all right, let's have another taste of our our older blend. It's slightly cool, slightly cool. There's a little bit of a, of this, maybe a little bit of fruity acidity coming through now. All right, so let's try our, our new blend. Now this again is the Uganda Rwenzori, Rwenzori Kinsinki, oh, why am I? Rwanda, yeah. Uganda Rwenzori Kisinga Station Natural, along with a, Strictly high grown SHG coffee from Hirotega, Nicaragua. Oh, quite different. Mm. This, so, where this isn't heavy and like body, this is lighter and like a little bit brighter. It's not, it doesn't have, it has good body. Well, but this is heavy, heavier, lighter, right? Still a medium, full to medium to full body, but lighter. And this natural is really kind of punchy, coming through quite a bit. That kind of like brightness, that blackberry brightness is really coming out. Oh, that's really quite interesting. I mean, I did some preliminary blending with it before, but I haven't really, this is actually, so what, what these are samples from, these are samples from the production row. So this is, this coffee is actually in the grinders at Spro right now. This is no longer. We're gone, wait, we finished that. I finished that, I finished this batch today. And now we're moving to this one. <laughs> 
Oh, interesting. So it's generally still very similar. However, in the cup here, there is a bit of difference. A little bit lighter, a little bit brighter. That blackberry kind of brightness, right? A little bit of that blackberry acidity. There's still good cacao notes. And there's actually more of that. There's actually kind of a graham cracker-ish lightness. You know, that kind of like, um, that kind of, when you're eating graham crackers, you have that kind of grain, uh, bran kind of character to it. There's a little bit of that here in the newer blend. That should be quite interesting as espresso. Oh, interesting. All right, so we're going to continue to drink or to sip from the cup while we do our, our uh, you know, our usual cigaring today. So uh, what's going on? How's everyone doing? Is there any kind of, uh, any going, anything going on? Anything happening this week? And if you happen to be tuning in, thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate you spending the time with us here. We're here every Thursday night at 8 p.m., 8 p.m. Eastern. And um, yeah, if you have any questions about cigars, coffee, coffee and cigars, or together, separately, whatever you want, drop them in the comments below. We'll see if we can answer them. Either myself or someone from the audience can usually bring some kind of semblance of an answer. All right, so tonight's cigar is, the, is again, from Tobacco Leaf in Jessup picked it up there and this particular cigar is the JFR lunatic oh, oh, the lunatic torch and this particular one's called the dreamland and the dreamland the dreamland is a six and a half by 54 is that right six and a half by 54 it's pretty big it's here look at this look at this, look at this. it's pretty big Yeah, six and a half by 52, not 64. 54 was the one we had two weeks ago. All right, so evidently this was a cigar that, that, that um, Agonorsen released originally in 2016, and then they updated again last year, about a year ago in 2020. And it's, a, it's kind of got a shaggy foot. All right? Can we see it yet? There we go or open foot, whatever you call that. So that should be interesting. Oh, look at this. Tony is now the proud owner of a new Ford Ranger. Well, congratulations. Excellent to hear. You know, the interesting that that Ford Ranger, for the longest time, they actually had it out in pretty much everywhere else in the world except the United States. And I remember seeing it referred to as the International Ranger. And a friend of mine bought one Maybe about three, four years, four years ago, and I thought they were pretty awesome. They're pretty awesome looking vehicles. So did you get it by doing the whole, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting too much money for my trade-in kind of thing? All right, so the Lunatic Torch. Here we are. Let's get a close-up of it again. And this is, of course, from Agonorsa, which is made at the Tobacco's Valle de Jalapa in uh, Esteli, Nicaragua. So we're using a Corojo 99 wrapper from Jalapa in Nicaragua as the, did I say wrapper? Yeah, that's the wrapper. And then we're using binders from Esteli and, and Jalapa as well, as well as fill. So binder and filler from Esteli and Jalapa. And it has a MSRP of 9.99. So I think here in Baltimore at, at Rolls, it's probably 11.50 with the OTP. And it's a nice cigar, it's a nice size. I think the 52 feels nice and robust. You know, last week we did the Hoya Silver Toro, and I think that was 52 as well, but this feels like a bigger 52. Like, this is like, oh, oh. And Rusty misses his Ranger. All right, all right, right on. And Tony couldn't pass on the, yeah, I guess, you know, I mean, actually, uh, my, my, I think I mentioned this last week, right, about, about these deals. So my pest control guy came in today. And we're talking, and I was like, so did, what happened with your, your RAM? So to recap, he bought a RAM a few years back, and he looked it up, and he should be getting 50, 51 for the RAM on the trade-in. And he bought it for 45. And he was telling me today, he went over to this dealership that's close to where he lives. He lives over in Dundalk, so it's whatever RAM dealership is there. 
he went to them and they were trying to lowball him. They were trying to give him like 43. And he was like, what? Get the hell out of here. I'm going to go to Jones. So he just, but he, he decided at the end that he wasn't going to trade it in because, you know, otherwise he'd be, you know, spend up more money. And that's kind of what I was thinking. I was like, oh, I could get 28 for the Tacoma. But if I wanted to get into another one, it'd probably cost me another, you know, 10 for 38. And I was like, oh. If I'm gonna do it, I don't, I don't want to spend any money at all. I want to be like here, you give me, you give me money, right? That's what I would like to have. All right, so let's let's get into it. Let's so so the wrapper is nice, nice color. It's got a, I think the brownish that I'm seeing on the monitor here is pretty representative of what we have in real life. There's a light manure, barnyard. It's, so the wrapper, like some of the wrappers we feel are kind of oily and slick and smooth and silky. This is a little more on the dry side, right? It, it doesn't feel as smooth. It doesn't feel as silky. It doesn't feel as sexy, you know? It's more like a robust. I kind of like this shaggy foot. I do like these shaggy foot cigars. I think they're kind of cool. I often wonder, like, how are they actually cutting that? Like, are they cutting the, the wrapper first and then rolling it straight? Because that's a pretty... They do a pretty good job rolling straight. I mean, well, of course, the women are well-trained and they're masters at their art. All right, so let's cut. We're gonna cut, we're gonna cut. Where's the banner? Okay, so we're cutting with the MTX tool from Zycar, not sponsored. I just had to put it up there. And this is the JFR Lunatic Torch Dreamlands. So we're going to cut. Oh, I got to spread out. <laughs> All right, so there's the cut. A little bit uneven. Yeah, a little bit uneven right there. So I'm going to even that out. It's a little bit harder when you can't really look, when we're not really looking at it. Uh, there we go. Look at that. There, that's that's a much nicer cut, right? So Tony says, my cost to run for the last five years was 142. Oh, not bad. Not bad at all. Excellent. Nice. Nice. All right, so now it's time to light. I think we should do matches. I was thinking about lighter, but you know, that's matches are a nice way to go, right? Especially these black tobacco leaf matches that are really long. All right, so, cold draw. Mm, nice sweetness. Mm, there's nice sweetness. All right, lighting time. The problem is I got this little fan here and it's blowing right across. Let's try again. Let's try again. Let me lose that banner. Look at this thing. This is a mess. You know, there was, a, there was a time years and years ago when I really paid attention to the art of lighting cigars. Now, ever since we got to the torch, the torch world, it's just this massive burn. Like, you just want to burn and burn. So, you know, the more, the more I've been thinking about it, the more... Oh, and now these matches break. Look at that. Rubbish. The more I think about it, the more I think that we need to, maybe we do need to have, you know, George come back on the show and do the whole light, let's how to light, how to properly light a cigar. 
Because I really got, I'm really out of control with it. Hmm? Right? We should be roasting it. Well, I guess, I guess by hook or by crook. All right, so here we go. Initial notes. Ooh, pleasant, pleasant. Nice flavor, some light spice, a little bit of cinnamon, black pepper, kumquats, roses, freshly mown grass. No, none of those things, I'm just kidding. Mm. But actually it starts off quite pleasant. I think this is a nice start to, to a cigar. Kind of, ex kind of exciting, good. Uh, like I'd say more of a medium bodied cigar. But there's an interesting spice to it that, that's actually kind of, you know, enjoyable and, you know, encouraging, like interesting. It's interesting, so you kind of, you're kind of, I'm kind of like, oh, I'd like to, to smoke more. Like last week, was it the, the silver had the, uh, the really bright character. And you know what, I'm just not really into bright cigars. This is definitely spicier, like not the black pepper necessarily. There is black pepper, but that's not the dominant spice. The dominant spice is more of maybe cinnamon, some nutmeg. Of course, the nutmeg could be from the bolognese I had earlier today, but that was a couple hours ago, so probably not. Like mulling spice, mm -hmm. like all, a little bit of allspice. Cinnamon, mm. a little bit of ginger. Interesting. So, what have you guys been smoking this week? Is there anything interesting? Last weekend, I was um, I was sitting around. I felt kind of in the mood to have a cigar, so I went over to the local cigar shop. And um, I was looking for like a relatively simple cigar for the afternoon, and so I found that Blackbird Finch again. A little bit pricey at $9, I think. So it's a Corona shaped, maybe it's $8. But pleasant, it's a nice pleasant afternoon, like light, not too heavy, not too challenging cigar, but just pleasant and enjoyable. The Blackbird Finch. And of course I bought a Revenge but I was also kind of in the mood, so I was like, let me buy something nice. So they had the Sin Compromiso. So I went there and I was like, oh, what, how about these Sin Compromiso? Which one do you think of the Compromisos I should have? And which, I'm gonna look up here to tell you which one I got. I can't remember the name of the actual cigar that I had. <laughs> no, the Torpedo, the section number two. You know, $21, $22. I know a lot of people love the, comp the Sin Compromiso. But to be honest with you, I, I, it was good. But was it like, it blows my mind that I'm gonna go buy more? No, unf unfortunately it wasn't. It, it just didn't hit my palate in that way, you know? It was good, it was solid, $21? Ooh, that's a lot of money. I, th I think it's a lot of money. But evidently, Steve posting that he released his yearly unicorn cigar. I think it's called the unicorn. Hundred bucks. Oh, maybe I'll try that. Maybe I'll try that. One guy that I spoke to that had tried it, he had had like at least two of them over two two separate years. He was like, "This is the best, the very very best cigar he's ever smoked." He actually compared the number two, the selection number two of the Sin Compromiso, kind of like to the Padron Twenty Six Anniversary. Hmm. I have to revisit those 26 anniversaries at some point. The Padron Anniversario, the original one, I love that. The 1000 series, very good. The 26, I don't recall. So, but I wonder, like, it, if that Sin Compromiso number two was, is very similar to 
the 26 my padron will i will i like will i find the padron 26 that compelling hmm. but this this jfr is quite nice nice spice not too spicy but just kind of medium spiciness you know like i said like mulling spices all spice a little bit of like ginger cinnamon um what's the one that i have on the tip of my tongue and maybe a light light brightness like a juniper berry kind of brightness but very very light in that respect of course there's some black pepper oh, a little bit of bay leaf that's what it is a little bit of bay leaf Ooh. so how does the ranger drive tony what do you think about it what's What's, what makes it awesome in your mind? Actually, what I was kind of wondering is, that, you know, the International Rangers been out for such a while, for a while now. You know, it makes me maybe kind of wonder, like, now they're releasing in the United States, how long will they hold that body style? You know, if, I mean, if in the United States we change bodies every year, or every five years, you know, the International Rangers got to be close to five. So Tony says, you would have changed your mind if you had smoked the Corona or Lancero. My Padron customers think the scene cover miso is a nice side. You know, and that's, that's interesting. And the guy that I was speaking to about it, he was like, yeah, you, he's, I said to him, which of these scene cover And I think he had at least one of the two that you were talking about. That you, I don't, can't remember the Corona or Lancero, but he had some other sizes. Like there were like four sizes he had. And I said, of these so I sizes of Sin Carbon Miso, which is the one to do? And he said the, the Torpedo. And I like that size, you know, but I don't know. Maybe we'll try it again. Oh, yeah, so yeah, the International Rangers 10 years old, so it's changing after this year. Okay. I do like the sloped kind of nose angle on it. I think that's really cool. The interior is nice too, I think. Actually, I was thinking at one point, you know, a couple of years back, I was like, if I ever, if I ever was to move, I would like to. This, it's either that or the Toyota Hilux. So here's the draw. The draw, the draw is nice, smooth, just a little bit of resistance, but not too loose, and it also has um, a good amount of smoke. Really, really pleasant smoking cigar. The Ranger Drive's nice, more comfortable and, and peppy on the XL. Oh, nice, nice. Is it a six-cylinder engine or is it something else? You know, I had to ride out to uh, Columbia for some deliveries today, so I stopped by this place called Maryland Homebrew, and this is a place that I've gone to for many years when we were making wines, you know, years ago. But they're also big, of course, by the name, they're a big homebrewing place, right? So they, they have a massive selection of, like, of what you need for homebrewing beer. So finally today I was there, and I was like, you know what? I, was, I was actually went there to buy corks, wine corks. And... Mm, EcoBoost Turbo 4. Okay, excellent, excellent. So today I was there and I was buying corks for another project I'm working on, not, not wine-related, but coffee-related. And they have, of course, they, at, at this place, Maryland Homebrew, they have everything you need to make, like all the equipment, all the tools, all the measuring, all the chemicals, all of the ingredients, you know, for beer making. And I've always kind of been fascinated. Like, one of the things I've been working on sort of is this idea to utilize grains in the production of cold brew and i've been doing experiments over the last year with it as well as barrel aging of it and so what i mean by that is that i'll t i'll take blends of barley's grains infuse make it make a infusion into water 
and then use that heavy water to brew coffee and see what kind of results we can get. You know, I, I have an interest in the in some of the the taste profiles of some of the beers, but I'm not a beer. I'm not, but not into. I'm not trying to make beer. Right? I want to give that kind of flavor. That kind of not flavor, but the kind of maybe inference of beer, right? And so, ah, uh, and so what I thought today, I was like, I was just there, and I noticed they had these little kits, so I bought a kit. This beer making kit called Brewer's Best, and you know, when it comes to beers, I like darker beers. Like, well, I, I mean, I like. Like Hefeweizen's, maybe some Mertzen. Um, I do like Dunkel's and some of the box. Like there's a place in uh, Heidelberg that I like to go to, this place called Brauhaus Wetter. And every Christmas season, you know, after like November-ish, December, they have this thing, their Christmas box. And I really think that's just a delicious, delicious beer. But I do like the, the darker beers, like the Stouts and the Porters. I, they had this kit for Porter, right? And I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll make some. And of course, the last time I was there a couple, about a month or two ago, I was thinking about it, and the guy was like, oh yeah, it takes about eight weeks. I was like, oh, eight weeks, good Lord, that's a long time. But today I was thinking, well, it'll take eight weeks, but you know what? And who knows when it really will take. I mean, that's eight weeks if I started today, which I won't. I may not even start it for another month or two. Not flavor, but nuance. Yeah, yeah, kind of that. The idea is to, like, create a heavy water that will blend nicely or complementary with the coffee, right? So, like, I'll go through the... I went, like, when I was there before, I was going through all the bins of the, the different malts and grains, and I'm like... And they're really... Actually, they're quite tasty. Like, if you eat them, they're really quite good. This is actually... I did that way before COVID started, right? That was like in October of 2019 was when I was there before doing the, the grain buying. Mmm, yeah, see, that's, that's, so, but this, so this one, I was thinking that, what if I did some, you know, if, there, I'm, 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 I'm two parts of this, right? There's, here's this porter, right? So I was thinking, oh, I could put coffee with it, right? But then again, the other side of it is, That's been done before. That's not really exciting. Is, is that really interesting or exciting? Like, I've, I've, I have kind of not really pursued working with any breweries as a coffee person because, you know what, everybody does that. That's like, it's like coffee porter is just like, in my mind, it's a little bit like, oh. Really, I just got this because I was interested in maybe just seeing what it's like to make beer, right? So let's look inside what they got. I thought I'd share that with you. So they've got the instructions. So it'll make one gallon. Oh, one gallon, that's it? I should have bought the bigger kit. <laughs> well, whatever. One gallon, good Lord. Well, what am I saying? I don't really drink beer anyway to begin with. So here's the, 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 the instructions, procedures. A company called Brewer's Best. And then what else do we have in this? We have um, Safali S4. Dry ale yeast. By coming called Ferment. This is it expiring? No, two more years. Two more years for it expires. Uh, oh, a little ingredient kit recipe thing. Nice. A pack of the Bryce dry malt extract. Concentrated, concentrated brewer's wort products in the USA. There is amber dried malt. There is crushed chocolate barley and crushed carapils. So these are the grains that are that we're using. I guess we'll boil this, right? I guess we boil that. 
What else is in here? Priming sugars. A little like mesh bag. Nice. Some bottle caps. No bottles, just the caps. And then, ooh, hops. So two little packets of hops. I guess with any beer you have to use hops, right? I, I'm not a hops guy. All right, so that's pretty much everything in the box. Nice little setup. At some point in time, I will give it a try. And of course, I'll let you guys know what happens. Or taste what happens. Put that over there, good. So a coffee mop, yes, some, something like that I'm thinking, you know, at least with the, with the, the, the heavy water that I've been, you know, working on. But, you know, it, it's one of those things where, like, you have these grains, and you'll boil them to infuse the water with them. And there's different, there's many different grains available. And then you'll, you'll try to brew the coffee with that. And then, of course, the coffee, the, the, whatever coffee you use is going to have its own flavor profile. So trying to find, you know, for me, the idea was to try to find complementary flavors in all those components. And it's just a long process, you know, it's just a long process of trying to understand or trying to figure out what you're doing. Like, I don't really know. I just have this idea, like, malts can be sweet. Can that go with coffee? It might be a terrible idea. All right, so we're in the first third, well in the first third, and it's pretty nice. Relatively enjoyable. Let's, uh, I'm going to tap it out because it's getting a little bit long. So I dropped it off. Yeah, the Lunatic Torch Dreamland, 6.5 by 52. Smoking well, like enjoyably well. All right, so let's taste with our current blend of espresso. By this point now, oh, it doesn't have quite that same, I mean, I guess it does have that brightness. I was going to say, but I didn't, of course, I'm tasting it by itself, so I don't have it to compare with the other one. But as you can see, most of the sediment has settled. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of drinking it. Of course, the thing is that if you're going to drink from the, the cupping cup, you don't want to shake it too much. Otherwise, everything gets released, and then you have to deal with it. There's a little bit of, like, coffee grinds floating in it. Let's compare that to the A now. So the, it's been, like, 40 minutes since we started brewing this. Oh yeah, there's still there's still quite a bit of difference. This is definitely the A, definitely is the heavier blend, a lot more heavier dark chocolate. The other one's got a dark chocolate, but not as as dark. And the A definitely has the heavier of the bodies. So what else? I didn't, really, I didn't really order anything this week, although I did buy, I ran into this guy a couple weeks ago at the camera store. He was trying to sell some, some gear, and um, he just wasn't going to get enough for it. So I ended up talking to him, and I said, hey, man, gave me his number, and we ended up making a deal. I got a really sweet deal on this. And, like, for most people, this is really not anything to be excited about but you know i get excited about those kind of things all right so what this is this is what's called the it's from a company called atomos and atomos makes production equipment for video production essentially and this is the atomos ninja inferno let me get it out of here it's in a form-fitting case. This is the Atomos Ninja Inferno Monitor. 
and it's a seven inch 4K monitor that records, so you can actually plug in a SSD hard drive into this carrier, slide it in, and you can record on board with this. And what, what that means is that you can actually take an HDMI signal from your ca camera, let's say up to, up to 4K, or 4K 60p, and you can run that in and then use this as a recorder, which allows you to do different codecs. Then this one has two different codecs. There's a HDX, I don't know what that is, and there's ProRes. And the ProRes is what's, uh, what's, be what's better for Max. And then it's got, you know, uh, let me see if I can power this up. It's actually quite a nice, like when it, it's, it's a few years old. When it came out, it was like, I think over $1,000. I was able to get it for a much, much, you know, a quarter of that, right? So it's a heck of a deal and it's still in good shape. It's a little bit, oh, this is the, uh, this is a D-tap. That's not the right one. I need this. Oh, he's got the, uh, huh. he's got it like zip tied, he's got it zip tied closed. I haven't, I just got it yesterday, so I really haven't had the chance to, to get into it. Oh, come on, come on. I gotta be careful not to cut the, uh, the power cable. That'd be terrible. There we go. All right, hang on. Let me plug this in. So why did I get this? Really? I've been looking for an external mon. I've been thinking about getting an external monitor for the cameras that we use for the the YouTube channel, and you know, some of the a lot of them are run this range. And Atomos makes these lines of monitors that are really advanced and really high quality. And so, you know, for the similar price as some of the the cheaper manufacturers, that would be five inches. I could get this one, which is a seven inch, so larger, and it could be. Um, what is it called? Oh, so I can record to it. So it's got a lot more versatility. Now, the downside is it uses these Sony NP batteries, right? And for you to use the full-size 970 batteries, it does make it pretty heavy, especially if you're using two. So maybe that's, that's a downside. All right, let's plug it in. And we're going to turn it on. Let's see what happens. Uh-oh. Why is it not turning on? Oh, there it is. Right, right. You can kind of see my setup here. I got two monitors, right? Huh? So as you can see, it's all touch screen. It's touch screen, and there is um, uh, you can have multiple audio inputs. There's actually a, a micro a headphone out output, so you can actually um, see it. You can actually hear what you're recording, and so uh, it's got these. You know, I don't really even know what it's got because I haven't. I really, I got it yesterday and I haven't really played with it yet. So you've got different controls. I don't really know what these buttons do. <laughs> of course there's playback and oh, whatever. And then, you know, he volume, headphone volume here, headphone volume, uh, headphone input meters. Then your record and playback functionality. And then these, so what these are, these are different you can have different ways of evaluating your shots. So there's different waveforms and, and things you can use to to determine focus and, and whatnot. And of course, it's not really going to make much sense because there's nothing plugged into it. But that's kind of what I got into this week. It's kind of cool. At some point, I'm going to figure out how to use it. All right, so... Put that away. How about you guys? Did you get anything interesting this week? Any kind of cool toys that you might be 
Nothing. That's pretty much what I've been into, these two things. So Tony's asking, 60% of Kitakawa instead of, yes, yes, essentially, essentially. 82 for the older blend, 62 for the newer blend. <laughs> so Tony, are you at home? I know Rusty's pretty much at home. And if you're also watching, what are you guys, what else are you guys smoking? Let, drop those in the comments below, I'd like to know. It's a little bit on the warmer side now in the room here. All right, so let's see you here. So we're, we're well into the cigar now, and let's have a comparison to see what the other people have to say about this. Let's go to our favorite people, our favorite friends at Half Wheel. All right, so this is the Half Wheel. This is from um, the reviewer Charlie Minato from uh, May 26, 2020. And here are the three different sizes of the torch. I think they're kind of handsome looking. That, that other one here, this, uh, the Mad Folk, the one on the, on the right, on the left, it's uh, four by four to 34 by 70. 70, crazy, that's crazy. So Charlie says, ooh, a covered foot. So yeah, actually I, I like the, co the covered, is that what they call covered foot? Oh, whatever, open foot, whatever. So he says a covered foot is generally going to be messier than a normal, but I, I didn't have any messy problems with it. Okay, let's go down here. Where's his first third notes? Oh, here, first puff. Here we go, first puff has cocoa. Underlying sweetness. I got some of that sweetness. Coffee, I guess. Well, you know, I never taste coffee because maybe because I'm drinking coffee, so it wouldn't really apply in my case. The finish is very interesting with a dry jasmine tea like flavor. Mm -hmm. Added sweetness. He had some, some harshness for the flavor. I didn't have any harshness. Sweet cherry nuttiness, generic flavor mixtures. Hmm. Retro hills are very sharp with lemon and lavender. Hmm. Bread flavor on the finish. Hmm. Tobacco, mild caramel. Hmm. Interesting. Kind of a very different experience than I had. All right, let's look at someone else. Who else do we have here? We have, um, oh, this is from Agonor. So this is their actual, so this is what the box looks like. Nice, right? Yeah, nice. Coro, Nicaragua, Agonorsa, eh, whatever. Let's not get too much of that. So, Cigar Dojo, let's see what Cigar Dojo have to say. Okay, so, oh, this is, oh, these two must, must be the two iterations. So, Lunatic came up before in 2016. I think the one, the box on the left is the one is the design that they had back then. And Tony's saying that everybody's at Everett. So what's going on, guys? Who's hanging out over there? Who's hanging out with you? All right, so appearance. Uh, we already had them in the appearance. Smoking experience. Torch lights up quickly. Yeah, yeah. Before the wrapper, blah, blah, blah. You know, I didn't read any of this beforehand because I didn't want to have any kind of um, influence. I, I actually, I used to write extensive notes went on from the different reviews and ahead of time, but I decided lately that maybe that's influencing what I'm experiencing, so I, I've kind of stopped that these last few weeks. <sighs> Unsurprisingly, okay, so he says that, meanwhile, the taste is producing characteristics of anise, white pepper, but bitter citrus rind, sweetness beads in the background. Unsurprisingly, there isn't any sort of epiphany as you burn into the wrapper. This depends on the wrapper's potency. You know, interesting. I don't really, co cocoa is 
Let's see, sweetness becomes more crisp and clean in the palate. Cocoa remains dominant. Sweet as in demerara sugar, bitter cocoa, vanilla sweetness. Hmm. Vanilla sweetness remains, cinnamon and grain. Okay, there is some a little bit of cinnamon. Cinnamon, some grain. All right, so that's the first. What else do we have here? Cigar Cooper. Let's see what Will Cooper has to say. Oh, this is the older one. Okay, well, never mind. Oh, here's the new one. Okay, there's the new one. Okay, so this is the new one. Okay. All right, tasting notes. Notes of earth, black pepper, cedar, and fruit. Ah, okay. So I think that, that Will is getting some, something that's closer to what I experienced. We were talking about the black pepper, cedar, some of the fruitiness. I don't really, I don't think I really had any notes of fruitiness. There was sweetness in the cold draw, but not, not really anything much else. Interesting, interesting. Now he's talking in the second, third, he's gonna have um, increasing black pepper and cedar and fruit. And now we're, we're just kind of, I'd say we're kind of just transitioning into, into the second third. You know, it's a pretty long cigar. So, Now it's a little bit on the, now there's a little bit more brightness. We'll be into the second, third. Which might be more, which I think is more complimentary with the, the current blend of the espresso. And that's something that I should, I should mention, like, people always ask me, you know, what is espresso? Should espresso be dark? Should espresso be this? And really, what, what is espresso? Espresso really, Espresso can be anything you want it to be. And espresso really is just a manner of brewing coffee under pressure in a concentrated form. It's really nothing other than that. So you can use any kind of coffee to make espresso. Now we call it the espresso blend because we have a particular idea of what the ideal espresso should be for us at Spro. And so that's what we use. We use different coffees to blend and roast to that to achieve those flavor notes with the espresso machine. But there's no hard, fast rules that say that you have to do it this way. It has to be this roast profile. It can be anything you want. The most important, like I had someone ask me today about espresso and you know, was telling, he was telling me that he really likes making like pour over kind of coffees, Chemexes, things like that. And he prefers like light roasted coffee, but he was like, you know, I just, someone just gave me an espresso machine you know, do I need to get, you know, dark roasted coffee? I said, no, you don't need to get dark roasted coffee. If you like the coffee you're using now, try using that. Experiment a little bit. Taste, because really, what, at the end of the day, the coffee is something that you're consuming. And really, you want to, if you're going to do anything, you might as well enjoy it, right? So enjoy it to what you like rather than what other people tell you you should be liking. You know, that's one thing that I've, I've kind of come across, that I've kind of come to over the last 20 years in coffee is that I'm less hardcore in that respect. Where if you're, if you're someone that enjoys a particular type of coffee, whether or not it may be to my taste or not, that's, that's, that's irrelevant. You know, as long as you're enjoying it, I can't tell you that you're wrong. I tell you that you're wrong. Like, I can't be that pretentious. All right, so we're going to take off this band or we're going to try to take, oh, that's too, it's too sticky. Forget it. So the burn's a little bit uneven. And I, as, you can, as I think today, we haven't been smoking it as hard. So, yeah, but the ash is nice and white, yeah. You know, in, in, espresso, in the espresso world, the coffee world, you hear, you hear people talk with all kinds of ideas, all kinds of theories. A lot of it is just 
some of it, some of it is just crazy, crazy, crazy. Like one guy is insisting on the forums that there's this like brownish crema, right? The crema can be really dark brown and with like flecks of brown. And he's like, well, that's, that's those are signs of under extraction. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a guy that doesn't understand any, uh, any of what we're doing. But you know, it, there's the question, like, do you argue with someone that's a fool? No. That I will not do anymore. So the draw is really nice. It's, it's kind of gotten to this point where when we started out the cigar, it was really kind of spicy and exciting and complex. It's probably still the same, to be honest with you, but it's one of those things where it's, it, it has those characteristics, but it's been the same now for this big, long cigar. And so as we're getting closer to the center, it's still kind of static in that flavor. So the palate is becoming more and more accustomed to those flavors. So the, the palate is a little more dull. My palate's a little bit dull to those flavors now. It's one of those things you kind of want to hurry up. I hate to say that, but you know, it's, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's long. We're going what? We're a good 50 minutes into this particular smoke, or 40 minutes, so it's got a long, it's got a long way to go. So a good movie cigar. Speaking of movies, I just watched last night that new movie with um, Chris Pratt, The Tomorrow War. Pretty good. It's starting to like get a little bit really burning hard, and as you can see, the ash is starting to curve. Right? You know, it's kind of threatening that it wants to canoe. I'm also, I'm also kind of a, I'm all, I'm kind of a part of thinking that maybe I should touch it up on the side, you know. But I'm kind of holding off of that. But anyway, the Tomorrow War, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Interesting, like the idea is that, you know, it's like today, suddenly these, these beings, these, these humans, find a way to time travel back in time from 30 years in our future. They come back and they're like, okay, we're, 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 in, this, we're in, in this war with this alien species that is wiping us out and we need to recruit more people to fight. And that's what they do. They recruit these people to fight and they send them forward in time. And pretty much most people that are sent forward in time are decimated. They're just wiped out because, you know, they're civilians and they have no idea what they're doing. Of course, Chris Pratt's, Chris Pratt's character is a formal special ops guy. So he's going to live. Of course he's going to live because it's his movie. And he goes in forward in time with a couple, you know, a couple guys and a little bonding kind of thing or maybe not so bonding. And then he meets, you know, whoever he needs to meet and they, they, they think they found a way to, to kill these aliens. But that doesn't work. So he goes back. So what happened? Why he goes back? Because evidently in their system, they will, they will, fo you, know, you wear this kind of like this contraption, right? That does the, the time travel. You travel forward in time 30 years and your time of service is seven days. If you make it through those seven days, you're automatically transported back to your, to this current timeline. And the way their time travel works is that time is constantly in motion, right? So while they can transport you 30 years ahead, so that would be, let's say, like today's July 8th, right? If we were to go there today, at July, we would be fast forwarded to July 8th, 2051, right? 30 years. On July 15th, 2051, we will be transported back in time. However, time is always moving forward. It's always linear. So we can't go back to July 8th, 2020. We're going to come back to July 15th, 2021, right? Because there you're, so it's always constantly moving. So, so even though there's two time zones, two time periods, it's always moving forward. So at some point in time, there's, there'll be no way to go back, right? So I guess if the human race is wiped out, let's say on August 15th, well, there's no one to go back. So no one's going back and it's all over. 
and there's nobody to operate the machinery in the future that sends people back. So, so I thought that was an interesting take on the time travel thing. I'm trying to smoke it in a way that will even out the burn, but it's still kind of off. I kind of, I'm going to hit it. I'm going to hit it with a little bit of touch up. Oh, there's a lot to hit. Gosh. It's kind of troubling. My king, we're going to have to talk about this more. There we go. That's a little bit better. And they squeeze and go, yes, yes, they did. So I take it you've seen the movie, Brian. That, I thought that was pretty good. Global warming is real. It really is a problem. We need to settle that. And how the, they landed the aliens. I thought that was an interesting way that they, they explained that. And that was interesting. I thought that was pretty good. And then I think it's always good to see J.K. Rowling. Is it J.K. Rowling? J.K. Simmons. Always good to see J.K. Simmons. He's in the movie too. I don't know if you saw that. What was that movie that he had? That, that TV series he had where he's, I forgot the, I forgot the name. It was a really clever name, but basically he's in Berlin, working for this agency that controls an, another time travel movie where, or tra time travel TV series where there is a parallel universe. And his character travels back and forth between the parallel universe, you know, kind of making him an action star. So J.K. Simmons, you know. Goes from the editor of, a, of the Daily Bugle to action star. I dig it. I dig it. And then I was in the middle of my cigar then. So I thought, well, let me, let me watch something else. So I was watching a little bit of that movie, Nobody. The, the Bob Odenkirk movie. I don't know if you guys have seen that. We probably talked about that because I saw it. A, I originally saw that movie a couple months ago. You know, and Bob Odenkirk, the guy that plays uh, Better Call Saul from the, the Breaking Bad era. You know, he too is another action hero. <laughs> That's pretty good. I thought nobody was a really good one. So I think in a week or two, oh yeah, there it is. Yes, counterpoint, exactly, exactly. Bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. He was also in, um, he had a real small role in one of my favorite movies called Up in the Air, that, uh, that George Clooney uh, movie with uh, Anna Kendrick about flying people that fly around the country. I thought that was, he, he had a small role in that that I thought was really good. He's one of those character actors that you, you always see in different things, but you actually get to know who he is. Like a lot of the character actors you, you see in, in TV, movies, and commercials, like you just see them. And you never know who they are. But J.K. Simmons has been able to break through that, so you actually kind of know his name. And... Yeah, but Counterpoint, that was, I thought that was a really well done show. I wonder if that's going to continue. Let's see. Oops. Oh no, there will be no more. So I guess there was three seasons of Counterpart. There will be no more Counterpart series anymore. And Tony says, thanks to Liam Neeson, everyone thinks they're an action star. <laughs> I will find you. Speaking of Liam Neeson, I don't know if you saw that one that he's in now, The Ice Road. 
the ice is it ice road. Basically, there there are these truckers, and actually, it was interesting. Like the premise of the whole movie is that these guys are truckers on this ice road, and so evidently, in the in the northern parts of the of the world, over lakes that freeze over, countries will cut roads into them. So they're basically thick sheets of ice that they clear of the snow, and they have they basically use it as a road surface. And they drive across them. And I was reading about it. Well, first of all, I was like, the idea is that these truckers have to cross this road. And, and, and really, when you, when you learn what they're doing, they're driving semi-rigs across these ice roads. Man, how, of all things in the world to be doing, how exciting could that possibly be? Like you're driving on you're driving on an ice road, like across a lake. I, I don't. Initially, I thought, oh, how, what are these guys doing? Like, how can that be exciting? But in this movie, the ice road, they actually found a way to make it quite exciting. I thought it was quite, I thought it was quite fun to watch. Like, evidently, because you're riding on sheets, so you know, they, so the idea, the basic premise is that you're supposed to, they they do the they open the roads during the dead of winter, right? When the, when the ice is thickest and it's really super cold and everything is, is, is you know, hard. <clears throat> but after April or into April, May, they, they close the road because now it's getting thinner. So it's instead of it being like maybe, I don't know, 50 inches, four feet of ice, it's now maybe two feet of ice. And evidently, when you're riding these massive rigs across these, these, these roads, like I was reading about this later, the speed limit on a lot of these roads is like 10 miles an hour. Because if you go faster, it can actually create, the weight of the vehicles is so hard that as it's rolling and pushing, it actually can create like waves underneath the road surface that will cause the road surface to, to sway and buckle and maybe even break and then the trucks fall through and you die. So they actually found a, a good way in that movie to create tension and like suspense and action. So it was it was pretty good. Like and Neil, Liam Neeson, he's not he's not that guy from Taken that's like this some kind of super spy guy that's gonna kill you. He's just some dude that drives a truck and he's like trying to figure it all out. But that was a, that was a good show. That was a good movie. That was enjoyable. There's also something I've been doing this week. Uh, let me see if I can find it. So from the Weasel Fest, I got this box of what they call the El Catador de los Petit Gordos, right? And these are these small, thick um, cigars. Here, I'll pull it up so you can see. Here we are. So this is the... The, the Catador de los Petit Gordos. And Petit Gordos are four and a half by 60 cigars. Little short, thick cigars. And the, in, the, in the Catador, the tasting box, they include two of each of these cigars, except for the Wonderlust. The Wonderlust is, of course, not, not for distribution in the United States. But you get one of these, the C3, the Mand is it Mandible? And then you get the Intemperance Husband, the the piece from Intemperance EC piece, and then the war. So I've smoked these three, right? I've smoked the, the Neanderthal, the Aquitaine, and last night I tried the Cro-Magnon. And when I did the first one, the C3, the, the Neanderthal, you know, of course, like, the Neanderthal is Roma's, like, man backo, the taste tosterone kind of thing. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, personally, the Neanderthal is generally just a very strong, fierce, forceful cigar. Really, it's not one that I terribly enjoy. You know, it's just kind of like this thing that, that just, it's always attacking, right? It's not as attacking as that, that craft 2018. That was just like blisteringly punching you in the face or punching me in the face the entire time. But it's definitely a, a solid, like, fierce, 
strength, right? But the C3, there's actually really a nice character to it because of the, the size and the flow of the, of the smoke and the draw. Now, I've been kind of wondering, like, you know, as you can see, I'm, smoke, I'm actually smoking it in this order, right? So the next I'm going to do the Whiskey Rebellion, the Husband, and then the, good, then the Peace, and then finally the War. I'm thinking about maybe saving the War for one of our, our episodes here. Because after smoking the first one, it kind of made me wonder, like, will the BA, the Intemperance BA-21 war, will that be such an experience that I'll want to replace, that it may usurp the revenge? Hmm. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm wondering. This is what I'm wondering. And so Tony says, was it a nuclear weapons rig like in the Liam Neeson movie at the end of Daddy's Home? Daddy's home too. No, no, they didn't. They, they didn't do it. It's nothing. It has. So I'll, I'll give you the basic premise. The basic premise is that there, up in the northern parts of Canada, Manitoba, there is a, a diamond mine, and the diamond miners have evidently punctured into some methane gas that caused an explosion, and then a collapse of the uh, the mine. And so the mine. There's like 30 miners that are stuck. And, or 27 miners that are stuck in there, and they have 30 hours of air. So the whole idea is that they're down in, um, I guess, Winnipeg, and there's this, this trucking company that will... So what they need to do is they need to bring a wellhead from the south to the mine to evidently, I guess, disperse the methane gas. Why they don't have a drill head on site? Because they have all the apparatus, so all they have to do is drop this drill this uh, drill head rig, bolted in place, and then it's all soft. Why they don't have one of those on site at the mine to begin with, I, I, that, I don't know. They don't really talk about that. Tony says it's not possible. Yeah, probably not. And the idea is that the, the, so Larry Fishburne is the owner of the trucking company. And he recruits Liam Neeson, who's a, dr who's a truck driver, and Liam Neeson's brother in the movie, who's a mechanic. And he recruits this one girl that also has experience on ice roads. And they're gonna, ri they're gonna drive up three rigs with each of the rigs has their own um, drill head or well head. And um, then they're doing three of them for redundancy, right? So if one makes it, so hopefully one will make it in time. And so. They have a time limit, so 30 hours. Yeah, and it's, they did a fairly good job, I thought. I thought it was good. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's an ice, you're driving a truck on an ice road through the snow. How exciting could that be? Yeah, I thought that was pretty exciting. So speaking of these uh, these petite gordos, they are quite good. I think they're quite good like that. The Aquitaine and the cro Magnon were very good. Whiskey Rebellion, I'm interested to get into that. Like, I'm wondering what the Whiskey Rebellion, because, you know, like, I've had a lot of Whiskey Rebellions, and they're good, but they don't speak to me as well as the, the other Intemperance lines, like, especially the BA, of course. The BA is really my favorite. But I'm interested to explore them, you know. So how are we doing here? We're doing well with the lunatic from JFR, the dreamland. It, it, it's kind of evened out on the burn. We still got a long way to go. We're only in the second third and we're still rolling. The flavor is still very consistent, still that kind of spice. That light brightness that developed earlier in the in the, uh, the early part of the second third, still with us. I think I'm gonna tap it to, just so I don't lose it. There we go. So what about you guys? Any cigars you're interested in trying out or planning to give it give a go?
I'm trying to think, what else have I smoked recently? I'm still smoking through this uh, bundle of the Stolen Thrones Crook of the Crown Robusto that I've found. They're still quite good. One thing about doing this show is that you always, I always have to keep my hand <laughs> pretty high up, so it's, sometimes it's a little bit odd, because, you know, like, I'll be, I'll, hold, I'll be holding it like this, and, of course, it's below the camera angle, so it's like, oh, I better hold it back up. And, so at least it looks like I'm doing something. This, the burn feels a little bit slower right now. You know how sometimes when you're smoking and things are going really smoothly, you good draw, good copious smoke, and then suddenly it just kind of maybe tightens up a little bit and slows? That's kind of happening at this very moment. It's suddenly, maybe because I dropped, maybe because I dropped the uh, ash and exposed the cherry, suddenly it feels a little bit tighter. So it's getting a little bit, there's a slight bitterness because of it. Slight concentration of heat on the tongue. Oh, you know what we should do? Maybe we should try a little bit of beverage. I forgot to bring a glass. So, we're going to have to get a tasting glass here. We'll do a little tasting with the Diplomatico. The rum. Oh, you know what I saw? The, speaking of alcohol, what I saw this, what I just discovered this past weekend is something called the Coravan. Whoops. And I thought that I'd share this with you because it's something that I thought would be kind of interesting. So here it is. So this is the Coravan wine system. And basically what it is, there's one for sparkling wine that they're just about to introduce at some point. So this is the Coravan. And the, Cor but the idea is that, as you can see, there's this needle, right? in these different models. There's three different, there's four different models. They all have different, they're, they're all, they all work essentially the same way. They just have some different features, right? Like the highest, oh, there's actually five because there's another one that's not shown here. Where is it? Did they have it here? Anyway, so the idea, the other one has like apps and like electronics and all this, but basically the idea is that you clamp this on top of your wine bottle and the wine bottle you leave with your cork. And this really only works best with like natural corks. If you have a synthetic cork, it doesn't really work very well. The idea is that you, you clamp this unit, the Coravan, onto the, the top of the bottle, and then you plunge the needle into it. And then as you can see, there's this little tiny, this thing here, this little knob and button here. And you use, the, and so in this, in what they have these little canisters, these are like little canisters of argon gas, which is an inert gas. And argon makes up 1% of the air we breathe. So it's perfectly a safe thing to use. And what this does is it, it injects through the, through the needle, it injects argon gas into the bottle that will displace the wine that you're taking out. But by doing this argon gas displacement, you can pour yourself a glass of wine without oxidizing what's inside the bottle, okay? And so the idea is that if, you, if you're someone like me that likes wine, but doesn't have many people to drink wine with, you can then pour like one or two glasses at a time, and then the bottle will, when you pull the cork out, or you, when you pull the needle out, the natural cork will kind of seal itself, right? So you can, 
people have tested, or the Corvan says you could do several years out. Other people that I've watched online with their reviews, they do six months and they have good results. So in, in like a you know, longer time period, you can drink a bottle of wine and still have its original kind of experience. Hmm. Inting, how's it going, man? Good to see you. So Saka Stillwell looks interesting incorpor incorporating pipe tobacco. Oh, I haven't heard of that. Let's see. Let's add a new one. And um, Dunbarton... Let's pull that up and see. All right, let's pull that over here. Dunbarton Trust. Still well, I'm not familiar with that. Let's see if we have it listed on his website. No, okay, let's see. Dunbarton Cigars. I've not heard of this one yet. Perhaps if I was going to the to the trade show, I would get to see this. I was thinking about going to the let's get rid of that. Oh here we go. Cigar Coop. Of course Coop will have all the information we need to know. Still well star. So let's see what Will has to say. The cat is out of the bag. Mm. So working with tobacco from from Cornwall and Deal. Ah, F F B. Okay, F B. Mm. Let's see if it, let's see if it, if uh, Will has much as so. Oh, here we go. Aromatic number one. Finest of aromatic black Cavendish Golden Virginia Burley pipe tobaccos. Added to a mild, oh, interesting, interesting. English number 27, by youth number 20, number 32. Oh, that's interesting, Perique. You know, I don't know if you guys remember, there's that, there's that Philippine cigar company, Tabacalera. Um, they were using the Perique in their one line of cigars they were doing exporting to the United States on. I don't know if you guys tried that. That was an interesting cigar, I thought. Oh, that'll be interesting to try. I wonder if it's gonna, when it's gonna start to hit. Shipping is anticipated late 2021. Oh, yeah, so they will showcase it at the PCA show starting, what, on Friday or to, on Saturday. Yeah, I was, I, was plan I was thinking about going. Actually, Raul had a ticket for me, to, had a pass for me to use, but now's not the time. Things are kind of expensive. Plus, you know, cars, are, everything's expensive. Cars, flights, hotels. Oh, yeah, and, and Drew has that Kentucky fire queue. That's true. That's true. That's right. Yeah, there's some interesting stuff when you, I think, that they can be possible with the pipes, tobacco in the cigars. But have they done anything like cigar tobacco for pipes? You know, because I still enjoy, I enjoy this, this kind of savory character of cigar tobacco. I haven't really tried much as far as that in, in the pipe world. Oh, yeah, flight over bookings. Although, I don't know if you watch this guy on YouTube, this guy, um, the Food Ranger. He was just he was posting a video where he flew from Malaysia, where he's been for the past year, to Dubai, where he, I guess he's going to relocate to Dubai for a while. And he was flying Emirates out of uh, Kuala Lumpur. And pretty much his flight to Dubai was empty. So it's interesting to see, like, in other parts of the world, like, the, that airport is completely shut down. Like, every, everywhere inside the KL airport was closed. Like, all the shops, and pretty much empty. And this, I think his flight, which is a... Typically, they fly 777s, and he looked like he was the only person... I don't know if he was the only person on the plane, but he was definitely the only person in business class. And I was like, wow, that's... 
That's crazy. So it's it's crazy to think that like another like while we have a lot of overbookings here in America and like flights are going up pretty full, that the rest of the world is still kind of empty. Ah, Cornell and Deal does have pipe tobacco with cigar in it. Oh, it does warp. Now that makes sense. Those warp guys are kind of crazy like that. And then Tonio says, I need to up the game to the bored housewife. At least a bottle of the... <laughs> ah, that's an expensive way to enjoy some wine. Oh, I see what I forgot. I forgot to turn on the light. There we go, that's better. I should sit more like this so you can see it. That's a, a, a painting of, <coughs> oh gosh. <coughs> it's a painting I got from when I was at the Cigar Safari at Drew Estate that Jesse Flores did of a Liga Provada number no. nine cigar and ashtray and I thought so if you've seen the actual ashtray it's a clear crystal ashtray and I thought and I thought the I thought the way they rendered the in, in oil the glass or the, the crystal was really well done So I picked it up from, from Jesse when I was there that, that year. Someday I'll get a frame for it. I did get the, I did get the, 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 what do you call it? The frame, is it frame? Not frame, but it's the, so the, the it came just the canvas and rolled. And so I had to stretch it on a frame, staple it to the frame. And now I, at some point I'll get the actual frame around it. But I was thinking about one of the gilded, like the real nice kind of like ornate looking ones for like paintings. But they get kind of pricey. So I was like, oh. So the cigar, we're moving sort of to the end of the second third. And it's smoking still stay the same. A little bit of brightness, a bit of spice. Like I said, I think my, my, after smoking this relatively static flavored cigar, my palate has become a little bit accustomed to the flavor. So it's that spiciness that, that before I was talking about cinnamon and, and um, a little bit of juniper berries for that, that brightness. And ginger is kind of, it's still there. It's just that it's not as bowl because I think I'm just my I'm just getting I would palate fatigue really I think would it best way to describe it let's see what those guys have to say about it the guys from uh, you know oh not that one Where'd it go? Whoops. Oh, this is the, this is, um, oh, Cigar Aficionado. Let's see what Dr. Cigar Aficionado says. Notes of honey roasted peanut, coffee bean, and cinnamon. Yeah, I don't get the, I didn't really get the, well, maybe you could say honey roasted peanut, but eh, not really. It's, and again, the coffee bean, uh, CA is like the second review that's talked about coffee. Again, I don't know if I get the coffee, but I think that's more because I drink coffee with it. So any kind of coffee apparentness in a cigar would be a little bit more diminished because I'm, I'm probably thinking that I'm getting any kind of coffee. I would identify any coffee flavor from the actual drink rather than the cigar itself, if that makes sense. But they're giving it a 90. 90. Go back to that. No, not that one. No, not that one. Well, let's see what these guys say. Mm, like this guy. Flash of popcorn sweetness. Like a butter popcorn flavored jelly belly candy. Nope. 
Well, I don't know about that. Molasses charred nuts, heavy toasted bread. Mm, maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's see what Charlie had to say still on this later. So Charlie says that in the middle portions, the flavors are a little bit more refined. The flavor gets toastier with some cardamom, dry pasta, and reduced acidity. Oh, interesting. Pasta, cardamom, burnt meatiness. Burnt meatiness with burnt pork skin. Flavor, body, strength are all solidly full. Yeah, I can see the fullness. Yeah, we're starting to get closer to the final third. So he says here, picking up individual flavors in the final third can be tricky. I, I, I can kind of see that because, like I said earlier, the um, I feel like the cigar has been relatively stable or relatively uh, stagnant, for best better term, for lack of a better term. So... The flavors are consistent, but it's not like, since it's not changing, it's not really, the palate gets a little bit tired, gets a little bit. So, Inting, what are you smoking tonight? Well, let's try it with the uh, Diplomatico. Does that add anything? Hmm. Maybe a little bit, but nothing too, nothing too Nothing too, nothing, nothing terribly exciting by, by pairing it with this diplomatico. So here's some news today. I was looking at CNN. They've said that CNN was reporting that the Pfizer vaccine is starting to see waning immunity from COVID-19 in its COVID-19 vaccine. So evidently, uh, Pfizer, if you have that one, it's not really working as well as the Moderna. So it looks like uh, Pfizer is starting to work on a booster that will, I guess, I guess to help really combat that Delta variant that's really kind of harsh. And evidently they're saying that um, the only people that have died lately in this past month from COVID-19 have been those who have not gotten their vaccination. So if you haven't got your vaccination, you probably should get one. One of my friends, she has the Moderna. She's fully vaccinated. And evidently, she was telling me recently, last weekend, she's like, I went to this wedding, or two weeks ago, maybe three, when I saw her. She was like, I went to this uh, wedding, 150 people. Why would you go to a wedding with 150 people? I don't know. But she got the COVID again, or she got it, even though she had the Moderna. <laughs> but it didn't evidently it wasn't that bad like she she made it through and um, you know, she had some I forgot what she had but she she was ill for a bit but she pulled through and evidently from what I've been hearing from other people is that part of the reason why she got I mean she survived the Delta was that you know the Moderna works pretty well so Moderna takes away that the threat of dying So maybe it's time to keep wearing the mask.
Oh, and evidently there's a country club in Georgia called Pine Tree that had a triple homicide on the 3rd of July. So somebody came in, killed their golf pro. Man, things are not safe at the country club. Killed three people. And what else happens this week? So, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of this one, but somebody came into the house of the president of Haiti, gunned him down, killed him, shot his wife, and now Haiti's under martial law. And uh, wow, that's cr it's crazy there. And evidently, the people involved were six Colombians and two Haitian Americans who evidently were just uh, unhappy with uh, Jovenel Moise's rule as president. Evidently, President Moise wasn't quite well loved. He wasn't really a, a, a hard line kind of guy like most, like, like Papa Doc and uh, other leaders of Haiti. And he wasn't really one of those guys that had a really clear plan. So I think there's a lot of people that are unhappy with his his um, his rule and of course you guys have heard of the uh, the collapse of that building in Surfside so they have what 28 people are they declared dead and uh, like a hundred I think over a hundred people are missing So it's coming along. It's it's a little bit more heat. A little more bitterness is coming out now. Yeah, definitely getting hot. Definitely starting to become unpleasant. Have you guys been seeing the, the Loki series? There's another episode that came out yesterday. I haven't seen the fifth episode, but I watched the fourth. That's been pretty good. And then also Black Widow comes out, what, today? Tomorrow? This weekend? I'm interested to see that. Also, Fast and Furious 9 is out. But I think that's only in the movie theaters. <sighs> yeah, this is starting to get a little bit more bitter. Just a little bit rougher, you know. So let's see what they say. So... Let's have a look around and see what the guys say about this. So Charlie, for his cigar, he gave it 87. Lunatic Torch is certainly not going to make a personal of favorites in 2020. Annoyances with the mess aside, the flavor profile just makes sense. Yeah, he had a, I think Charlie had a completely different flavor profile than I experienced. And then let's see what these guys say here at um, Cigar Dojo. Do they give a, here we are, 91, 86, 87, 89, okay, oh, no, that's not it, 90, so 87, 89, 90, so not bad, not bad scores. I think I would concur, you know, with that kind of range, 87, maybe more like 88, 89. It's a good cigar. It's, it's enjoyable. Well, it's enjoyable the first, the first third 
definitely very enjoyable. Second third, pretty good. Right so far in the last third, not quite, not quite as good, not quite as good. Would I buy it again? Maybe I'd buy the smaller one. You know, the one that's, um, where is it? The one that's uh, the shorter of the three, even though it's 70, this one. I'd probably want to try the, the 70 ring gauge, the four and a half by 70, even though it's really big. It, it might, be, might be a little more interesting. More importantly, it might be shorter. Well, it being shorter, Maybe the flavors will be exciting throughout the entire cigar. Like, I'm finding that this last third is definitely more of a chore. But construction overall has been really good. The draw, actually, right now, the draw, there was it was a little bit tight through this part here. Now it's this last puff starting to loosen up. Maybe that's because I'm I'm getting more of an ash more more of an ash buildup here, right? There's a little more ash buildup now. Maybe there's something with that ash cap that keeps it cooler and a little bit better to smoke. I I kind of noticed that during each of the the taps, the flavor would the the cigar would not be as enjoyable for a few moments until the ash returned. So what about again? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's hard at, at, at $10 or so. There's a lot of really, really great cigars at that price point that are really enjoyable throughout the entire, the entire smoke. So it, this might be a, a little bit less of an enthusiastic purchase for the next round. Plus within the Aganorsa range, there's a lot of great cigars Aganorsa makes at this price point and even less that are really, really enjoyable. Like the Illusione series comes to mind. Or the warp stuff is really, really great. I'm gonna tap it again. We're really coming down to the end now. Right now the acidity is a little more pronounced. I don't know, have any of you guys tried this cigar? They finally repa finished the repaving in front of the sh in front of the studio here, in front of the roastery. When I came back into the shop yesterday morning, or yesterday afternoon. So where this, where the building is located is right next to the road. And so I don't know what the foundation or whatever it is, but basically anytime heavy trucks roll through, you can feel them like a small earthquake and so they had the heavy like you know grading machinery and all the the paving machinery running so when i came in yesterday there's a bunch of stuff that had fallen off the walls like a couple of the glass french presses and a couple of glasses came off the wall and were all over the floor that was a little bit distressing Luckily, the glass and the French presses can be easily replaced. So nothing, nothing major damage, but. All right, so we're coming down. Yeah, bite again. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Next week, we're going to be doing the, Trin the, Tr the Trinidad Espiritu Fundador series number one, which is a Lancero shape. It's the, funda the, the Trinidad from the Dominican line. 
the what Altada cigar. Looked like an interesting cigar to try, so that's why why I picked it up. And then for week 52, we're going to be, um, I, I haven't decided on that one. That's actually closest to our one year anniversary of doing the show. So I'm going to be looking for something really nice to, to, you know, to mark the occasion. Maybe even that Dubai cigar. If Raul still has that anymore, maybe we'll do that one. Or if I can end up finding that unicorn, maybe that. I was thinking about one of the Fuente, the one in the black tube. I don't know if you've seen that one. I forgot the name of it, but I was thinking of that at one point. Something kind of out of the ordinary that I would not normally go for. All right, that's enough of that. We're gonna put that down. Whew. There it is, the Lunatic Torch Dreamland from JFR, Just for Retailers, which I guess I didn't mention that the JFR, meaning Just for Retailers, is really a cigar line that Agonorsa designed just for retail. So I don't believe that it can be bought online or it might maybe it can maybe that's changed I, I remember years ago when i first went to visit the agonorsa factory that that was the thing that it was it was the jfr was just for brick and mortar retailers but if i look across yeah if i look across you know you can find them at jr atlantic two guys famous so maybe not ci has it as well so maybe maybe not maybe it's just now yeah you can get anywhere all right, so that's pretty much it for the week. Thank you very much for joining me. Really appreciate you spending another Thursday with us, with me here. And as always, we're going to be doing this every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. So come back again next week. And, um, yeah, you know, what else is there to tell you? You know, if you want to try the coffee, the Espresso 99, we've got that on the website, sprocoffee.com. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in. Enjoy your cigars. I hope it's going to be a good week coming up for you. And see you next time.